Chapter 8. The Deadly Poppy Field. Our little party of travelers awakened the next morning refreshed and full of hope, and Dorothy breakfasted like a princess off peaches. Oh, and Dorothy breakfasted like a princess off peaches and plums from the trees beside the river. I was like, I've never heard the expression, she's a, she's a princess off her peaches. Behind them was the dark forest they had safely passed through, although they had suffered many discouragements. Of course, we're not going to mention any interesting plot points. But before them was a lovely sunny country that seemed to beckon them to the Emerald City. To be sure, the broad river now cut them off from this beautiful land, but the raft was nearly done, and after the tin woodman had cut a few more logs and fastened them together with wooden pins, they were ready to start. Dorothy sat down in the middle of the raft and held Toto in her arms. When the cowardly lion stepped on the raft, it tipped badly, for he was big and heavy. But the scarecrow and the tin woodman stood upon the other end to steady it, and they had long poles in their hands to push the raft through the water. They got along quite well at first, but when they reached the middle of the river, the swift current swept the raft down the stream, farther and farther away from the road of yellow brick, and the water grew so deep that the long poles would not touch the bottom. This is bad. Correct, <clears throat> said the tin woodman, for if we cannot get to the land, we shall be carried into the country of the wicked witch of the west, and she will enchant us and make us her slaves. And then I should get no brains, said the scarecrow. And I should get no courage, said the cowardly lion. And I should get no heart, said the tin woodman. Okay, we I think we get the get the point. And I should never get back to Kansas, said Dorothy. We must certainly get to the Emerald City if we can, the scarecrow continued. And he pushed so hard on his long pole that it stuck fast in the mud at the bottom of the river. And before he could pull it out again or let go, the raft was swept away, and the poor scarecrow left clinging to the pole in the middle of the river. Goodbye, he called after them, and they were very sorry to leave him. Indeed, the tin woodman began to cry, but fortunately remembered he might rest, so he dried his tears on Dorothy's apron. Is Dorothy wearing the apron? Of course, this was a bad thing for the scarecrow. You don't say. I am now worse off than I was when I first met Dorothy, he thought. Then I was stuck on a pole in a cornfield where I could make believe to scare the crows, at any rate. But surely there is no use for a scarecrow stuck on a pole in the middle of a river. I'm afraid I should never have any brains after all. Down the stream the raft floated, and the poor scarecrow was left far behind. And the lion said, Whoa! A talking lion. The same thing must... That's not the lion. <laughs> oh, no. Something must be done to save us. I think I can swim to the shore and pull the raft after me. If you will only hold on fast to the tip of my tail. So he sprang into the water and the tin woodman caught fast hold of his tail. When the lion began to swim with all his might toward the shore. It was hard work, although he was so big. But by and by, they were drawn out of the current and then Dorothy took the tin woodman's long pole and helped push the raft to the land. They were all tired out when they reached the shore at last and stepped off upon the pretty green grass, and they also knew that the stream had carried them a long way past the road of yellow brick that led to the Emerald City. What shall we do now? asked the tin woodman as the lion lay down on the grass to let the sun dry him. We must get back to the road in some way, said Dorothy. Yeah, what what else would they do? The best plan will be to walk along the river bank until we come to the road again, remarked the lion. So when they rested, Dorothy picked up her basket, and they started along a grassy bank, back to the road from which the river had carried them. It was a lovely country, with plenty of flowers and fruit trees and sunshine to cheer them all. And if they had not felt so sorry for the poor scarecrow, they could have been very happy. That's life, right? If I wasn't so sad all the time, I'd be happy. They walked as fast as they could, Dorothy only stopping once to pick a beautiful flower, also known as killing. And after a time, the tin woodman cried out, hey, Look! Then they all looked at the river and saw the scarecrow, perched on his pole in the middle of the water, 
looking very lonely and sad. What can we do to save him? asked Dorothy. The lion and the woodman both shook their heads, for they did not know. They shook their heads yes or they shook their heads no. How do you shake your head to say I don't know? So they sat down upon the bank and gazed wistfully at the scarecrow until a stork flew by, which, seeing them, stopped to rest at the water's edge. I just want to say so far, this chapter has not at all been about a deadly poppy field, as the chapter title suggested. I think it'd be more apt to name it they go through a river and leave behind the scarecrow and a stork comes along. Chapter 8. <clears throat> Who are you and where are you going? Asked the stork. It's a musical, by the way, for some reason. I am Dorothy, answered the little girl, and these are my friends, the Tin Woodman and the Cowardly Lion, and we are going to the Emerald City. This isn't the road, said the stork as she twisted her long neck and looked sharply at the queer party. I know it, returned Dorothy, but we have lost the scarecrow and are wondering how we shall get him. Where is he? asked the stork. Over there in the river, answered the girl. If he wasn't so big and heavy, I would get him for you, remarked the stork. He isn't heavy a bit, said Dorothy eagerly, for he is stuffed with straw, and, and if you will bring him back to us, we shall thank you ever and ever so much. Well, I will try, said the stork. But if I find he is too heavy to carry, I shall have to drop him in the river again. So, the big bird, not the Sesame Street big bird, but the stork, flew into the air and over the water till she came to where the scarecrow was perched upon his pole. Then, the stork with her great claws grabbed the scarecrow by the arm and carried him up into the air and back to the bank, where Dorothy and the lion and the tin woodman and Toto were sitting. I really like this stork. I think this stork is amazing. Uh, we finally have a strong female character, unlike Dorothy, who has just kind of been buffooning around for the, for the last several chapters. When the scarecrow found himself among his friends again, he was so happy that he hugged them all, even the lion and Toto. And <laughs> what? Why would, why would we assume he wasn't going to hug them? And they walked along as he sang, Todi Radio. Oh. What? Todi Radio. At every step, he felt so gay. I don't, I don't know what Todi to, to to Radio is. I was afraid I should have to stay in the river forever, he said. But the kind stork saved me, and if I could ever get any brains... I shall find the stork again and do it some kindness in return. Let's let's make sure we hold him to that promise that he does do that at the end. Also, you don't have to have a high IQ to be kind, right? That's all right, said the stork, who was flying beside them. I always like to help anyone in trouble. But for now, I must go, for my babies are waiting in the nest for me. Oh yeah, I forgot that's how baby, babies are made. It's the storks. I hope you will find the Emerald City and that Oz will help you. Thank you, replied Dorothy. And then the kind stork flew into the air and was soon out of sight. They walked along listening to the singing of the bright-colored birds and looking at the lovely flowers, which had now become so thick that the ground was carpeted with them. There were big yellow and white and blue and purple blossoms beside the great cluster of scarlet poppies which were so brilliant in color that they almost dazzled Dorothy's eyes. I know I'm not a literary critic, but they almost dazzled her eyes. I, I just don't think it's worth mentioning. If they dazzled her eyes, bring it up. If nothing happened, don't put it in the story. It's, it's, it's like the news, right? I saw this, this headline just this week. Emma Watson is not retiring. Okay, that's... That's not a news story. That's something that's not happening. That's called not the news. There, there are so many things that have not happened. They shouldn't be making headlines. And I saw another one a couple years ago. It was like, the headline was, no, Taylor Swift did not hide herself in a suitcase. I'm like, I didn't think she did. Who thought, who? Uh... Aren't they beautiful? The girl asked as she breathed in the spicy scent of the flowers. Spi the sp spicy? 
I suppose so, answered the scarecrow. When I have brains, I shall probably like them better. If I only had a heart, I should love them, added the tin woodman. I always did like flowers, said the lion. They seem so helpless and frail, but there are none in the forest so bright as these. Helpless? Way to turn flowers into misery, lion. They now came to more and more of the big scarlet poppies, and fewer and fewer of the other flowers, as they soon found themselves in the midst of the great meadow of poppies. Now, it is well known that when there are many of these flowers together, their odor is so powerful that anyone who breathes it falls asleep, and if the sleeper is not carried away from the scent, he sleeps on and on forever. I don't know if that's well known. I mean, we know it from the badly titled chapter. But Dorothy did not know this, nor could she get away from the bright red flowers that were everywhere about. So presently her eyes grew heavy, and she felt she must sit down to rest and to sleep. But the tin woodman would not let her do this. He says, not by the hair on my tinny tin tin. We must hurry and get back to the road of Yellow Brig before dark, he said, and the scarecrow agreed with him. So they kept walking until Dorothy could stand no longer. Her eyes closed in spite of herself, and she forgot where she was and fell among the poppies fast asleep. What shall we do? asked the tin woodman. If we leave her here, she will die, said the lion. The smell of the flower, the smell of the flowers is killing us all. The lion's hitting puberty. That's, that's why his voice is changing. I myself can scarcely keep my eyes open, and the dog is asleep already. It was true. Toto had fallen asleep beside his little mistress. But the scarecrow and the tin woodman, not being made of flesh, were not troubled by the scent of the flowers. Run fast, said the scarecrow to the lion, and get out of this deadly flower bed as soon as you can. We will bring the little girl with us, but if you should fall asleep, you are too big to be carried. So the lion aroused himself and bounded forward as fast as he could go. In a moment, he was out of sight. Let us make a chair with our hands and carry her, said the scarecrow. So they picked up Toto and put the dog in Dorothy's lap. And then they made a chair with their hands. Eh, that's not really what a chair is. They made a chair with their hands for the seat and their arms for the arms. And carried the sleeping girl between them through the flowers. On and on they walked. And it would seem that the great carpet of deadly flowers that surrounded them would never end. They followed the bend of the river, and at last came upon their friend the lion, lying fast asleep among the poppies. The flowers had been too strong for the huge beast, and he had given up at last, and fallen only a short distance from the end of the poppy bed, where the sweet grass spread in the beautiful green fields before them. We can do nothing for him, said the tin woodman sadly, for he is much too heavy to lift, and we must leave him here to sleep on forever, and perhaps he will dream that he has found courage at last. That's one way to look at people dying. I'm sorry, said the scarecrow. The lion was a very good comrade for one so cowardly. But let us go on. I don't understand why he had to put that little jab in there. They carried the sleeping girl to a pretty spot beside the river far enough from the poppy field to prevent her breathing any more of the poison from the flowers. And here they laid her gently on the soft grass and waited for the fresh breeze to waken her.